Thank you, Tim. It's nice to be back. I was here about a month and a half ago, so some of you, this might be a repeat. But, okay, so I'm doing a project on the Carmen's River, dealing with fish passage, and we are, first a little background. For those of you who don't know, the Carmen's River is just a little bit to the west of here, um, of b and and it, the river is, our study area is about three and a half miles, and it empties out into Bellport Bay. It's the third largest river on Long Island. It's one of New York State's wild and scenic rivers, and much of it flows through state, federal land, so much of the shoreline is protected, so it's a really pretty river to, to visit. There are four dams on the river itself. Two are within our study area. One has recently had a fish ladder installed, and one is a cement dam that is used basically for crossing the river. <coughs> and you have your typical Long Island River species. We have tessellated darters, we have pirate perch, we have brook trout, we stock it with brown trout and rainbow trout, and there's other things, there's a couple sunfish, a couple bass, but really typical species for Long Island River. <coughs> so why are we doing this study? There's a, lots of different information we get out of this study, and one of them is to figure out what is happening to our stock trout. New York State DEC stocks trout um, in the fall and in the spring, and right now, in the last couple years, there's a statewide study going on. It's called the FOST study, or the fate of stock trout. So the information we get will hopefully give us some insight to what happens to our stock trout. We are also looking at diadromous species. Diadromous, I mean catadromous and anadromous. We have brook trout, which could be diadromous, and rainbow trout and brown trout and the American eel, which is catadromous, which means it's, it lives most of its life in fresh water, goes out to the sea to spawn. We are also looking at the effectiveness of the new fish ladder that was installed in 2008, and then also if the cement dam is passable by fish. So what is pit tagging? Pit tagging is, is a little tiny tag. It's a passive integrated transponder tag. We use a 23 millimeter tag. We make a little incision in the fish, depending on the species, where we put it. The, the wound heals up very nicely. We have a very good survival rate. And then it doesn't have a battery or anything. All it does is, as the fish swims through antennas that we had built up and down the river, it triggers the antenna to record that data, the, a date and time stamp for each fish that passes through the antenna. So it's very much like Easy Pass. Same, same type of technology. Okay, so this is our study area. It's, like I said, it's about three and a half miles. There are seven locations on the river where we have antenna arrays. Three of them are, were built and maintained by Cornell, and those are these, these three in the red. Down here is the tidal section. So there's one antenna that's in, <coughs> just right at the Wertheim Wildlife Sanctuary. Then we have another one up here. This is one of ours, the DEC antenna. It's on the fish ladder. That is our first barrier to the freshwater system. We move up. There's another one from Cornell. This is the cement barrier that we have an antenna at. And then we have two more further up. And then all the way up by the LAE is another Cornell antenna. So this is our equipment. At each site, there is two deep cycle marine batteries that have to be changed weekly. There is a reader, a data logger, and a multiplexer. Multiplexers are used when we have several antennas at one location. And then tuning boards that are attached to each antenna. These, th these are the antennas going out to the fish ladder at the, the Hard Lake site. So this is our first site. Well, this is the first DEC site. Like I said, there was, there's one below this in the title portion maintained by Cornell. But this is the first DEC site. And originally, we had a setup where we had three antennas installed on this fish ladder. We have one at the entrance right here. This is the tidal section, tidal waters. We have another one at the exit over here where the fish come out. And then we had one at the spillway so we could determine fish leaving the system as well as going up the fish ladder. But then Later in the season, or actually last year, we changed it to get a better idea of exactly how the fish ladder is working. 
So we decided to put an antenna here as a turnaround. So now we get a really good picture of what's going on with the fish. This is the next site up. This is a cement dam. This is uh, about halfway up our study site. This is basically a way for people to get to and from the east and west side of the river. There are boards put in here to increase the water level, basically for waterfowl hunting. But we were assuming that this was passable by fish. So we installed an antenna downstream, right here, and then two upstream. So again, we can see fish making attempts to go up to pass this barrier. This is our next site at the wing dam at line six. This is a pass over antenna. So this is, the antennas can work two ways. You can pass through the antenna or go over it. When you go over the antenna, it's, it's a little bit less of a read range, but we do get really good results here. But this is a nice picture of it underwater. And this is further upstream. This is our longest antenna at 87 feet long. And the only reason such a large antenna works at this site is because it's very shallow. It's only a couple of inches deep. So we get pretty good read range here. Okay, so last year was the start of this study, and we tagged a total of ourselves 105 fish, I'm sorry, 503 fish, consisting of American eel, alewife, and the three brook trout that are in the river. And then Cornell also tagged some of these fish, um, but we had in 2012 a total of 742 fish, and then this year in 2013 we added to those numbers and now we have, I think, 16, someone can do the math, but 16, 1,630 fish total that are tagged in the river. And like, these tags don't expire. So as long as the fish has that tag in there, it will be red as long as the antennas are still up. So one of the, the things, we're, one of the reasons we're doing this study is to figure out what is happening to our stock trout. A lot of times we stock trout in the river, we know fishermen catch them, we know fishermen take them, but we really don't know where they go in the river. And basically, these are our results. These are, this is from 2012, and we saw that 55% of the stock brown, brown trout moved downstream, just a little bit downstream, not all the way down. Two went back up, two moved downstream, one made a beeline straight down to the tidal section within, within 18 hours. And then one of those fish one of the, we stock larger fish in the tidal section. One of those fish climbed the ladder and moved upstream. So that's very few fish that did a lot of movement. So basically, we're seeing that they're, they're not really going anywhere. They're not moving out of the area we stock them in. And the same thing goes for rainbow. 43% were detected downstream. Three went down to the tidal area, and one moved up. So basically, this is exactly what they're doing. We stock them, and this is, this is a site this is probably the one wing dam down from where we stock them, and they just sit there, much like they do in the pens where, in the, where they get raised. So they just kind of sit there and hang out and wait to get caught. But you can see there's, there's brown trout in here, there's rainbow trout. I'm pretty sure that's a brook trout back there. And they just kind of hang out and sit there. And these are known hot spots, so fishermen go to these spots and have very good fish catch rates. Okay, so brook trout. Brook trout um, were stocked in the river historically a long time ago, but now they are naturally reproducing, and we want to bring this population back. Um, so we want to see what these guys are doing. So this is another way we're looking at data. I'm going to show you a couple different ways we look at the data, but this is basically, these, these bars are individual fish at each antenna. These are the antennas down at the bottom. And then the, the line, the dashed line that corresponds to the color is where we tag those fish. We did electrofishing surveys. We catch the fish at the dashed lines, release them, and then these, this, the bars show you where, how they moved from their original tagged location. So this is in May, just after we did the majority of our tagging. And pretty much, the, the, you know, they don't, they don't wander too much from their sites. And as they go through the months, June, very little activity. We know they're in there, but they're just not getting picked up by the antennas. 
July, same thing, not much activity. Same thing, August, September. But then in October, we start to see the, the fish move a little bit further up. They go, start to go upstream a little bit, and in November. And this is what we expected to see. This is right around their spawning time, and the, a known spawning location is just around the wing dam <laughs> area, so we're, and, and blind nine. So we, we expected to see the fish move up there. So that was um, good results. And then this just shows you, this, this peak here is the number of detections. This is number of detections per month. So this peak is right around the time we tag them. And then it dies down a lot. And then we see a little bit of an increase, again, around their spawning time. So basically, they didn't move too much. They, none of them went down to tidal waters. One of the questions we were asking was if these fish had any inclination to go to the sea. And we did not see that at all. And like I said, we did see them move into the spawning area. OK, alewife. So alewife is a very important forage fish, as we all know. And um, having the newly installed fish ladder, we want to see if these fish are using the fish ladder and if they will get up into the fresh water and use it to spawn. So in 2012, we tagged 64 Carmen's River fish. We, didn't, we weren't really happy with that number, so we decided to go to the Peconic River, where there's millions and millions of alewife. And we transplanted some of those, tagged them, and put them in the Carmen's River, just to increase our numbers. And then this year, we did 104, 194 Carmen's River fish. I'm just going to go over the, this is the map again, but I want to take note, this is the first barrier, the fish ladder. And this is the second barrier. So really, if they get fish, if the alewife get up this barrier, they have all this area to spawn. And then if they get past this, then they have, you know, they increase their, their spawning area. So we didn't see too many get up the fish ladder. We only had two that made it past the fish ladder. And one of those fish, actually both of those fish were Peconic River fish. We, that may be because we, we caught them with a scap net and we, or with a cast net, and they weren't too beat up. Um, we just saw b better success with the Peconic fish. We really don't know why. All the other ones, this is only a handful, but most of the other fish that we tagged just hung around in the tidal section, went from Wertheim to the fish ladder, were hung out the fish ladder a lot, bounced back and forth. But really, there was no detections further upstream, so we're assuming that those fish did not get past the fish ladder. So these are the two made it over, Karma's River fish, none upstream. A bunch of the Peconic fish did hang out by the fish ladder, and, but seven only got, seven were detected to go all the way up, and two of those fish went all the way up the river. 2013, this we see a couple more fish made it up. We have a total of four fish that went up past the barrier. And actually, this one in red, he had a very good year. And he decided to go up twice and spawn twice. So he had a very good year. But again, we saw a lot of fish just hanging around in the tidal section. And then we had fish return, which was a really nice surprise. T fish that we tagged in 2012 came back in 2013. And even some of the Peconic River fish, which we really, we weren't sure what they were going to do, if they were going to be all disoriented and, or you know, go back to the Peconic River. But we did see fish come back. And this one that shot all the way up to blind nine was a Peconic River fish. And this one in blue was a Carmen's River fish but that, from last year. But all these other guys here, and this is only, again, this is only a portion of them, mostly hung around in the tidal section. But we did see a lot of fish return from last year. So out of all the fish we tagged, 22 of the Carmen's River fish were at the fish ladder. Three of them made it all the way up to the cement dam. And then we had the returns. Like I said, one Peconic fish. And then seven from last year, which was 11% return rate, which is really good if you're doing a tagging study. And they were all detected at the fish ladder. 
Some of these fish may have made it up over into the fish ladder, past the fish ladder, and hung out in Hard Lake, but we don't know for sure because there's a lot of data to analyze. I haven't quite gotten there yet. But they were not detected further upstream in any antenna, so we just, they were at the fish ladder. We, we have to do a little more analysis to see if they spawned. Well, we did actually, we, served, we electrofished in Hard Lake in this past August, and we did find one juvenile alewife. So we know that they're, they are spawning up there. They are hard to catch, even with the electrofishing gear, but we definitely had one fish. And it was a terrible picture, otherwise I would, I would show you. So we did see more of um, a success rate, not too much greater in 2013, but there's a couple of things that we think you know, may attribute to this. It was low numbers in 2012, because the, the runs do fluctuate from year to year. We used a fike net to capture them and tag them. And in the fike net, there were always a lot of white perch. And the white perch <coughs> just beat alewife up. And they were pretty beat up when we tagged them. We tagged only the, the really healthy ones, but still, this could have been real trauma to the fish. And then we did take fish from another river, so that could have you know, screwed things up a little bit. And then in 2013, we used electrofishing gear. The fish were in much better shape when we tagged them. We started earlier in the season. And it was a, definitely a larger run this year. And then also, we made modifications to the fish, lab, to the fish ladder. So we had um, Kurt Orvis from US Fish and Wildlife Service come down and assess our fish ladder. And he had told us there were a couple things wrong with it. This panel here, this is the entrance to the fish ladder. And this panel here, and this grate going up, is actually below mean high water. So at high water, the water is right at the top of this, which means the alewife would have to dip down and come back up, because alewife are known to swim at the surface of the water. So that's not really ideal for a you know, fish ladder design. And then also, he proposed that we put a diverter in here to reduce the turbulence from the dam, to, you know, so the fish could easily get to the entrance. So we made those modifications, and this is what it looks like now. Here's the diverter, the panel's missing, the grates increased, uh, raised. And um, so hopefully, we're thinking that's why we had a little bit of better success rates. But this antenna will remain in, in the following year, so we'll really get a better idea next year what's going on. So then we wanted to look at the cement dam to see if this, this is passable. It doesn't look, doesn't look too difficult, but um, it's very, very, the water rushing through here is very strong. So we, this is one of the questions we were asked. Is it passable? So basically, this is really early on in the analysis. There's a lot of data involved. And one of the problems with the antennas is if you have, the antenna will only pick up one fish at a time. So if you have a whole bunch of fish there, it's only going to get one. It detects at like, I think, every more than one time a second. But if you have a fish there, it's only going to pick up that one fish. And there is a known brown trout that sits at the bottom of the, of the cement dam and just sits there all day long, all day long, all day. Once in a while, you see him leave to go do whatever he's doing. But he's there all the time. So that may be screwing up our numbers. But this is basically the if a fish hit the bottom antenna, if it was detected at the bottom, and it was detected at the top, then I, I assumed that it was passable. So this is what we came up with. Basically, 45% of the trout that are in the river, 45% that are detected downstream were also <coughs> detected upstream, so that they can pass that barrier. American eel, 42%, and alewife, Again, I didn't have great, great numbers. I know more alewife got up, but if, since they do swim at the surface, we may not have detected them. But a rough estimate is about 25% of the alewife that try do make it up that barrier. OK, now we have eel. Eel, we did something very different. We um, suggested by Alex Harrow of uh, USGS Conti Lab, he wanted, since we're doing this big study, and we were catching many, there's lots and lots of eels in the river. He said, you know, tag few and see if, transplant them to the tidal and see if they have any homing capabilities. And we also wanted to see if eels use the Alaskan sea pass, which I don't believe was ever studied before, and if they are able to pass the sea dam. 
We do find eels up and down the river, but you know, we want to make sure they have an, a lot of habitat to get to. And if we are able to make things more passable for them, we, that's what we want to do. So this is, I'm going to show you, this is um, data. This is eight eels that were put into ArcView GIS by <coughs> wonderful Chris Scott sitting over there. And this is just going to show you how they move. So this is where we caught them, up by H, H gate. We moved them down to the tidal area with the tag, and we kind of left them. So as you see the dots, there are individual eel numbers next to it. And as the dots get bigger, you see the greater number of eels moving up the river. So first, sometimes the eels get, go down to Wertheim, but then most of them go right, try to go right back up to that fish ladder. And you start to see they move up and up and up. And basically, all of these eels made it back up on average in 79 days. So they traveled two and a half miles over two barriers to make it back to their home. And I'm told their home really close to where we caught them. So out of all the eels we transported, 51 successfully moved upstream to the original site. So this is from 2012. We did it again in 2013, so we'll have more results. And then we saw something that we, didn't, we weren't really thinking about, but we saw eels moving out of the system. And eels, when they're ready to spawn, they move downstream. They go spawn in the Sargasso Sea. So, and this is often happens during a big storm event. And what do you know, it was right dur during Superstorm super storm Sandy, where we saw 15 eels that were previously upstream move out into tidal, the tidal section, never to be seen again. So, Basically, there's lots and lots of data that's still to go through. Um, we're going to really concentrate on the fish ladder data and how long it takes the fish to get from the bottom to the top and how many attempts it makes. And the same goes for the cement dam. Um, DEC antennas will be maintained by Cornell and Stony Brook School of Marine Atmospheric Sciences. They will continue monitoring and we will help as needed. And then we also have a lot of data from electrofishing surveys where we have a lot of recaptures, where we scan all the fish that we catch in electrofishing surveys. And then also a creel survey, which went on for three years where we had um, an employee interviewing anglers. And we would scan those fish as well. But all this together, we can, we can, we can get a really nice picture of what's going on in the Commons River. And so I'd like to thank a lot of people involved, especially Kathleen Marine, who was my partner in this since day one. Um, and then I have a little video of let's see, all those trout hanging out where we stock them, which is kind of neat. And I'll take any questions. It'll come up. It's slow. Maybe not. I have a question. Um, are you taking questions now? Go ahead. Yep. Okay. Um, with all the, you know, uh, focus on restoring uh, native species, uh, particularly, you know, your, your your intro said that a lot of this land is protected. Um, seems like a good spot maybe to. Uh, I wonder if you're questioning, you know, stocking non-natives. Uh, yes, we're, in, in, that's you know, definitely and, one of the and, things. And you know, where is that at now in terms of? Well, right now we want to. We need to finish this study, but yes, definitely the information will be used to modify our current stocking methods. And um, yeah, because we do want to restore brook trout, so that's definitely something we're going to look into. Have you seen any uh, evidence of striped bass using the fish passage? No, I, you know, not at all. Unless it's in the camera. There, there was a camera installed at the exit, and I don't believe all that has been looked at. And I really don't know. I don't think Cornell has tagged any striped bass, but no, I didn't see any. I know they're in the tidal section. I know fishermen catch them all the time, but not using the fish ladder. How about uh, any other kinds of river herring in the Carmen's? No, I didn't. No, we, we saw in Hard Lake, we did catch a, um, what was it called? Uh, uh, 
Gizzard Shad, thank you. Yeah, we quote Gizzard Shad. Anyone else? Yeah, there's lots of different things you could do, but we people kayak up and down there, fishermen there, so you really kind of have to worry about that. Good. Okay, thank you, Heidi.